Welcome everybody to, um, to this webinar for Data Science in the News. Uh, this webinar is convened by the QUT Centre for Data Science and the Queensland Academy of the Arts and Sciences. So I'm Kerry Mengerson. I'm Distinguished Professor of Statistics and, Center, and Director of the Centre for Data Science, and I'm your moderator for today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Turrbal and Yuggera people as the First Nations owners of the lands where QUT now stands, and also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country from where you're joining today. So um, I pay my respects to their elders, past and present and emerging, and I recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, research, and learning. This edition of our Data Science in the News webinar series is in response to the recent rain and flooding, which has impacted not only Brisbane, but a large part of Eastern Australia. We acknowledge the, the difficulties that people have had during this, um, this, these flood events. And uh, what we want to do in this session is to listen to some insights about how we move forward. What's the future of floods in terms of predicting extreme rainfall, flood warning design, community resilience and urban design solutions? And we're going to think about these, um, these future of floods and the, um, these discussions um, in, from the perspective of members of our panel. Today, we're going to ask four experts in QUT and the Centre for Data Science as what they see, about what they see as important issues in going forward in the future of floods. So the panellists that we have today here are Dr. Kate Saunders, Professor Amisha Mehta, Associate Professor Karen Vella, and Professor Anna Delatek. We're going to ask each panel member in turn to speak for, to the topic for five minutes or so, and we'll follow this with a group discussion. So if you have questions for the panel members, then please put them in the chat. So that involves modeling climate extremes, understanding how the probability of extreme events might be influenced by climate change. And so Kate's research helps us to understand the probability of extreme climate and weather events and helps us to make informed decisions about natural disaster risk. So I'm going to hand over to you, Kate, to tell us how often can we expect extreme rainfall events to happen? Um, thanks, Gary. You cut out for a bit there, so hopefully this is all... Um... I haven't missed too much. I'm just going to share my screen now. I'm just going to make a brief comment about the Queensland and New South Wales floods today. And I want to make this comment from a couple of different perspectives. And that's, this is actually a photo I took from my area in Brisbane. Um, and that's, the floods have highlighted that we have some knowledge gaps. And these are things that we're going to have to work on as we move forward together. And two of the ones that I really want to touch on today is that we could do more to communicate the science with the mainstream audience around how often we expect these events to happen and how big we expect them to be. Um, and there's also a dimension to this as well, that if we're trying to help communities be prepared for these kinds of events, that there are some really novel solutions and data science that we could be leaning on more heavily. Okay. Um, and first and Foremost, I'm going to start with this little excerpt I pulled from an ABC News article, and it's about talking about the floods in Lismore, but similar conversations were had for Brisbane and other places. And this word unprecedented got used a lot recently with these floods. And I'm here to tell you that from my perspective as an extreme value theorist who works on understanding the probabilities of rare events, I don't think these floods were unprecedented. We definitely can assign a probability to the risk of events like this happening. Um, we can make decisions around how we mitigate that risk. So I, I wouldn't describe these things as unprecedented. And you can see here that we do have probabilities. We have two different probabilities listed. We have a one in 1,000 and one in 3,500. And these are kind of the standard ways that people describe for a given size flood, how often we expect it to happen. And this language is, it's cached in a certain way that can be particularly confusing for people. Um, and as a flooding or extremes community, we trying to ask people to think about these kind of language, this language in a bit of a different way. Um, but let's start by understanding what that means. So when we say something like a one in 100 year level, what does that mean? Well, you can think about it as like if we had a hundred sided dice and every year we rolled that dice 
And if we happen to roll 100 and it comes up, then it's going to flood that year. And if you want to think about it in terms of probability, we get that 1 in 100 from the probability of a flood exceeding some high return level. So the level is associated with that 1 in 100 event, 1 in 100 year probability is that return level. Now, when you think about a dice, it's really easy for us to know that if we roll it lots and lots and lots of times, that on average, we would expect that 100 value to come up kind of once every 100 years or once every 100 rolls, right? But that doesn't mean we can't roll 100 twice in a row. So twice in two years, it doesn't even mean we can roll 100 twice in the same year. So when we're using that language of one in 1,000, one in whatever happens to be, we've got to be really careful that people understand that these are long-term averages, but that doesn't mean they can't happen twice. Um, and if you want to take this one in 100 language and change it to a one in 1,000 or one in 3,000, what happens to be, you have to just take that previous slide I just showed and change 100 to X everywhere. And we're interested from my particular field of research is kind of interested in estimating this value of X. And when we're extrapolating outside the range of our data, things get highly uncertain. So that's why you can see big differences in how those numbers are reported. And it also depends on how you define the event. So is the flood the rainfall or is it the river height level or is it the aggregated total of rainfall across a region? Is it the one day total? Is it the three day total? And then all of these probabilities will change. So there needs to be some complexity in how we talk about these things. Um, but I suppose what I really want to get at here is that when we think about rolling a dice all the time, the probability is always the same. And when we talk about one in 100, the way I've described things, loading a dice is a really good analogy. But for us, the dice is loaded. Things like La Nina, that's part of our natural variability, they load the dice. They make having extreme rainfall and flooding events way more likely. So it means that those one in 100 or one in 1,000 numbers that are reported, they don't account for that loading of the dice. So they're not as meaningful as we would like them to be. And then the bigger problem for us moving forward is things like climate change and understanding how climate change is rolling the dice. And actually, it's not immediately clear to us. We've got to do a lot of work to understand some of those things. And we understand there's more moisture in terms of the thermodynamics, but how is climate change infecting our individual weather systems or the dynamic processes? And that's part of the equation we all need to do. And then the kind of final part of this that I really want to hit on is that there's also this compound event. So reporting that probability for Lismore as you know one in 1,000, but what about Brisbane? What about the probability that Brisbane and Lismore have a flood in the same year? Or Noosa and Brisbane and Lismore have a flood in the same year? We have to think about all of these things together to really understand the risk of these events. Um, and I'll take one or two more minutes now. All of that language, the how big and the how often is about long-term averages and that's climate. But we have this other dimension to this, which is kind of our short-term meteorology, like forecasts and warnings. And um, so when we think about the response to this particular event, actually some of where we were let down is in the translation of the weather warnings into impact-based warnings. And there was a lot more we could have done in terms of communicating with the community. And in response to that, we ran a hackathon up here at QUT at QUT and with the Center for Data Science, where we talked about different aspects of where we might like to improve upon our response using data science. And that might be things like looking at how we visualize flood extents. So how do we communicate uncertainty? How do we communicate timing and spatial extents? How did we use things like real-time social media data to understand the event? Could we have seen river heights in a picture that someone's tweeted um, or water in a street? Uh, we looked at road closures, we looked at contextualizing the events using past observations, and we looked at things like an individual's vulnerability. So if you're in a particular location, your vulnerability may be captured by things like how long was your power out for? And this was a discussion that we had in two days and we explored data and looked at ways we could use data science solutions in a more innovative way. Um, okay, so in conclusion, I think what I want to get at here is that floods are going to happen. We know that's the case. So us as scientists need to step up and we need to do a bit for science communication and help the general public understand what's going on with these events. Um, but also I think we can do more as a community to create novel data science solutions to help meet the gaps we saw in terms of what people needed in terms of a timely and quick response regarding these events. 
Um, so thanks everyone. Uh, thanks very much, Kate. That was excellent and um, really gives us some really good food for thought um, to, to start this discussion. Um, they're complex issues that um, and complex concepts that you've um, been talking about, and um, and I think it's um you know it's such an important thing for us all to be to be um, uh, considering in in when we listen to these kinds of statements. I'm going to turn now to um, Professor Amisha Mehta, and Amisha um, specialises in risk and crisis communication. So it's a nice follow on from um, from your talk, Kate, and um, she also talks about. Um, trust as well. She's from the Faculty of Business and Law at QUT and she applies this expertise in risk and crisis communication and trust in emerging industries like hydrogen energy and in the context of corporate health and natural hazard emergencies. And Amisha's research has been translated into new national policy via the Australian warning systems and organisational practice. So we've asked Amisha to talk about how her research translates into the future of floods and in particular thinking about mind the gap so towards community oriented flood warning and I think this also then follows nicely from your uh, your um, presentation as well Kate so I'm going to hand over to Amisha. Thanks very much Kerry I appreciate that introduction and also hearing the background um, and context that Kate provides. Uh, Mind the Gap is, is part of the framing here. And um, I too want to acknowledge the Turrbal and Yuggera people uh, as the First Nations owners of the land on which QUT stands and, and pay my respects. I think drawing on the work that our Indigenous communities have done with um, natural hazard management is really critical in the space that we operate as well. Um, so what I wanted to share with you was some research that I've been doing with my colleagues here at QUT and our industry partners uh, to give you a sense of community information needs, so community data requirements, but then also how that translates to the expectations that community members will have for response agencies. And we were lucky to do some work um, sponsored by the Office of the Inspector General Emergency Management. So Lisa Schuster um, led this piece with us and I can see Alison's online, so hi to you. Um, when we did this work, which was pre-flood event, so we, we conducted the research in 2021 and we asked community members about their information needs during flood events and then the information that would trigger behavior, um, behavioral responses for them in flood events as well. So you can see here, and none of this is rocket science, but an expectation that during flood events, people wanted advance notice of, um, of events, but they really were calling out for real time, localized and personalized information so that they could use that data to make um, informed decisions. Part of that also uh, included an understanding of the hazard and its severity, but also its impact. So some nice echoes to Kate's um, presentation as well. Once that information was there, which would have helped community members formulate a perception of risk, we know that uh, the work that I do in the risk and warning space is how can we translate data, operational data, complex data into information that community members can understand and that therefore enables them to take action. So the information that community members wanted specifically about flooding was the how-to content, what are the specific steps they should take either to prepare or to guide them about where they should go. And they also were calling out for accurate weather reports that supported their understanding of the timing of the event, which then subsequently would guide their action. So these are a few really interesting data points from 2021. Um, and what I want to show with you now is best practice research that uh, has been undertaken you know, in many different countries, um, but any warning should have each one of these um, six pieces of content in them. So this has been curated from research across the globe. 
a warning that we issue to a community member needs to identify the source, talk about the hazard, the location of the hazard, the time of impact, provide guidance. So this is the specific how to instructions and then follow up with the timing for the next update. We know that that last point about when the next update is to be released is often used as a bit of an indicator of the risk or severity of the event. Um, so I might look like I'm picking a bit on Brisbane City Council in this um, presentation, but I don't mean to do that. I, I really do genuinely come from a solutions point of view here, but I'm also in the Brisbane City Council region. So, you know, you're biased by getting what I received um, and followed. So you might recall for those of you who are also in the Brisbane City Council um, region, receiving this emergency alert that, that I got at 5.08 a.m., which I'm not awake at that time. Um, and other colleagues of mine and friends received it the night before and some received it in, in between that window. But if we look at uh, these, these concepts that we cover here, source, hazard, location, impact time, guidance, and time for next update, there are some gaps between what we would hold up as being best practice for warnings and what is communicated here. Now, certainly in an emergency alert where you have fewer characters, you um, may have to make a choice about prioritisation. But the one piece that I want to really focus on here with the presentation is the power of translating data into the behavioural actions that we need people to take. And so one of the things that came through in the messaging from Brisbane City Council, whether that was through an emergency alert or through a person, was this notion of, um, you know, evacuate if required. Um, and then subsequently, we received information about if your instincts are telling you that you're unsafe and you need to evacuate, listen to those instincts. And that to me is, is a really important opportunity for us to look at in subsequent events. So to be perfectly frank, I make decisions about whether I should buy and eat chocolate using my instincts and they're often not the best decisions to make, right? So we need to be, if, if we are communicating to community members with guidance instru and instructions. We need to give them really important decision criteria about whether they should be evacuating or whether they should be getting ready to evacuate. And here, here are the parameters supporting that decision. Um, and I think that in looking at some of the events that and the communication that we've seen, there's also been um, this interesting switch and or celebration of alternative sources of data about weather um, with a lot of movement to Higgins storm chasing and probably like many of you I, I was following them and sitting in on their um, broadcasts as well and that the way that they can engage and communicate and personalize if we put perhaps some of the data pieces aside is what community members were really calling for um, so I think as we're communicating as a sector, we need to consider trust, um, we need to consider source, and we need to consider what that means for us in an ongoing capacity as well. I just wanted to follow up and, and circle back that our research um, that, and this is research that we undertook with New South Wales SES several years ago now, uh, has really identified the importance of communicating and leading that communication about warnings with the behaviours that we're looking for people to undertake. So leading with prepare to evacuate as opposed to a qualifier about the level of the flood, moderate flood warning. Our research has shown people don't necessarily or immediately understand what moderate means versus major versus minor. People may not understand their location or may not have map literacy. Um, so we need to keep in mind that if we communicate with that behaviour first, we're seeing benefits and improvements of that in terms of risk perception um, and some support for that in a behavioural sense too. And, and that's really what's underwritten some of the new work in the Australian warning system. So that's all from me, but really happy to take your, your questions as we go through the rest of the presentation. Oh, thank you very much for that. That was excellent, Amisha. Um, and really, again, provides some, some additional food for thought. 
I'm going to turn now to um, Associate Professor Karen Vella. Karen is an urban and environmental planner specialising in community resilience and environmental change. And she's head of the School of Architecture and Built Environment at QUT. It's great to have this sort of diversity of perspectives in this, um, in this webinar. And um, we're going to turn to Karen now to talk about how we build this kind of community resilience after disasters. So over to you, Karen. Great, thank you. So um, thinking about communities that have experienced disasters and increasing frequency of disasters is a big concern for urban planners because um, one of the objectives of urban, urban planning is creating safe environments that meet all of the needs that that societies need for shelter, for access to reliable food and water and, and sanitation. And uh, as we've seen from the events over the last few months in Lismore and Northern New South Wales, uh, we have communities that are existing in really highly vulnerable locations. So um, how we can support those communities to be more resilient to these kinds of disasters and events that are only going to continue to increase over the coming years with climate change is a big concern. So um, one of the things I've been very concerned about in my uh, research is what these notions of community resilience are. And ideas of resilience, particularly as applies to people, are not new concepts. They've been used in fields of education, um, and thinking about children's resilience to different situations for many decades, but it's only been more recently applied at a broader societal level to think about what it means to have a resilient community. And there's a few concepts that are often bundled up in together when we talk about community resilience. Um, there's notions of resisting change, of being able to bounce back from a disaster, um, being able to adapt and transform our settlements and communities in response to big events. Um, it's about understanding where the vulnerabilities in communities are. Um, there's resilience as kind of endpoints of communities that might be linked to notions of sustainability, but also resilience is often talked about in terms of a process of building that adaptive capacity or that ability for communities to change and transform. And of course, there's social and ecological elements that intersect together. Uh, and, uh, and that's becoming increasingly important as we understand and look at the impact of these big events on our ability of communities to be able to adapt and respond. So one of the things that I'm very concerned about is how do we actually then go about supporting or building communities to be resilient, particularly following large events and disasters? Um, and also what then erodes that ability for communities to be resilient? Um, and some of the research that colleagues and I have undertaken over the last uh, 10 years or so, we've started to develop some frameworks of indicators that we can apply to assess how communities fit in relation to their ability to be resilient and adapt to um, disasters and, and emerging climate events. So one element relates to community aspirations and their capacity to take action. And that includes notions of stewardship, which relate to the way they're um, managing their environment and the aspirations that they have for managing environments in the context of environmental change. There's also really important elements that relate to the, vit um, the vitality of that community. How stressed is that community? Does it have access to reliable, affordable housing following a, a climate event? And what are the other factors, like how healthy is the social service sector in that community? Is it able to provide the support that that community needs following a disaster? There's really important aspects of cultural heritage. People need to be able to connect to places that are culturally and socially significant to them. And it's a really important part of people's um, understanding of whether or not they're okay as, as people and as communities. Of course, we also, um, there's a huge element that relates to the economic viability. And we have seen communities, particularly in Northern parts of Queensland that have been impacted by significant events time and time again. And over time that, 
um, exposure erodes the economic viability of those communities. And governance and the systems of government and decision making that uh, exist at all levels uh, play a really important role in the viability or in the resilience of communities. So taking this framework, colleagues and I have applied this to vulnerable parts of Queensland um, from the, uh, the, the Burnett Mary in the south up to the Cape York in, in the north to really examine how vulnerable and how resilient these communities are in the context of changing environmental conditions. And I don't want to um, look at the detail of this just to make the point that um, with a framework like this, we can start to map out those communities that are starting to struggle to manage um, environmental shocks and, and shocks associated with nat natural disasters over time. And that tends to be those regions in the north that are more exposed to disaster events. There, Things like this then also lead us to be able to identify at a broader societal level, what are the sorts of things that we need to build in order to help community adapt. Um, and it, it's, it's broad ranging, um, there, there's no one silver bullet, it relates to things from land use planning systems to having agricultural alliances that can support uh, those agribusinesses agri to engage in new products or adapt what they're doing. Um, it's regional landscape mitigation so that we're building uh, capacity to mitigate climate change into landscape um, events. It's very broad ranging. And the point of this is to say that building community resilience is really a long game. It's not something that is, can be done quickly. It, it's a long process. But there have been some events recently, for example, like the recent floods and thinking back to 2011 when the town of Grantham was flooded, there was a successful community relocation after that disaster, which was um, built on the basis of building the resilience of that community to future disasters. So um, I looked at that um, activity and one of the things that's very, very unique about it was that, um, I mean, people thought that there hadn't been floods before, but as Kate said, the history didn't play that out. There was actually a, a, a long history of significant events. And in the most recent history of events that then led to a very quick succession of activities that allowed that community to be successfully relocated to higher ground. It was a really big piece of work delivered in a really short period of time. The key lessons for us is that while community relocation to flood disasters is possible, it's actually really hard. And the system often works against people making those decisions. What really allowed Grantham to relocate was the availability of close, undeveloped and uncon unconstrained land, and that rarely occurs in our major urban, se urban centres. It was the small scale of the community at Grantham that was allowed it to be relocated, approximately 90 lots. The speed of the process was critical to success. Uh, planning regulations were often a hindrance because they slowed the time right down. Community engagement was key, and so was local political leadership and brokerage. But the lesson suggests that it may be a niche experience. There's limited examples of community relocation in the world, and I'm not sure that it provides us with the potential for rapid resilience building. So it may be that we need to keep working on the long game. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, Karen that was um, uh, that was really um, thoughtful. Um, yeah, I, I think that we'll, we'll, we'll certainly come back to some questions about that and some comments on that. Um, I want to turn now to our last speaker, who is um, Anna Delatek. Uh, Anna is Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering at QUT, and she's an urban water researcher and focuses on stormwater management and socio-technical modelling. And she, um, in 2012, um, she won the um, Victoria Prize for Science and Innovation for her lifelong achievements in stormwater research. So it's great to have Anna to talk to us now about the economic cost of surface runoff. So um, could simple urban design solutions save households from future floods? Over to you, Anna. Thank you, Kerry. 
Um, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about flash flooding, uh, flash floods. So this is actually a picture from Mighty Milton, um, which is partially caused by river coming out from, from, from its, its water course, but also from huge downpour we had um, over a very short time. Um, as you remember, maybe you know, in a couple of days, we had more than six, 600 millimeter uh, rain. And that caused uh, uh, basically lots of runoff uh, coming into our houses and, and causing damage, even when, when houses were high up. I know a few people free, here from QUT that had the damage, uh, damages in their houses, and houses were pretty high up. The problem with this runoff is that it actually is polluted often, even when you when it, when it's not coming in huge volumes and causing causes problems due to uh, pollution. Uh, the way to manage, uh, particularly pollution, but also more and more um, this uh, flash flooding, is using um, something called blue green systems. They, there are so many names of these things. So in Australia, we call them WUSU, Water Sensitive Urban Design, the Nature Based Solutions in Europe, Low Impact Development, and Sponge City in China. I per personally like this Sponge City. So I'm just showing you some um, realizations of this, like rain gardens, wetlands, swales, even green walls. So, what are these systems? Just trying to explain how they work. So, they work by um, basically trying to mimic nature. So in a normal catchment, let's think of forest, you have um, basically 85% of everything that comes from the sky, it disappears. Uh, in, you know, it infiltrates, um, uh, you have plants that take up that water, but only 15% filters through and usually not in direct runoff and comes into your river. If you pave area, which we do, of course, in our cities, it reverses. So now only 15% disappears and 85% basically um, uh, comes back into our rivers. So uh, the, the more paved, the worse. And that's why even if you're on top of a hill, not on top of a hill, but if you're up, up far from the river, there is lots of stuff um, behind you. Um, uh, or upstream catchments, you may experience much higher volumes um, uh, than, than, than um, you would expect. The idea of these nature-based solutions is to basically go back to nature and install some of these green systems, and I've showed you how they can look like, where they retain the tank as a sponge, soak this water, and if they are everywhere, they are doing this everywhere in the catchment. So that water never ends up in, in creeks and definitely runoff um, when, when uh, gets uh, stopped at the source. So uh, the, these are not just concepts. I'm showing some very old more sensitive urban design systems installed in Australia. But here you have to understand these systems in Australia, we mainly actually did design them for stormwater pollution control, which is a big weird, but in, because in Europe, particularly, they've been introduced and used for also flood mitigation, or basically doing uh, source control to stop all these runoff reaching um, our rivers. I'm just showing you something I worked on, 10,000 rain gardens in Melbourne, where we did designs of these systems to be so simple, so community adopted this, and it's actually built everywhere. And even worked in, in Israel, piloting some of the first uh, systems of this type. So the problem why, particularly in Australia, we don't design them for flood mitigation is that our models are not good. Um, and and um, it's very hard to predict what they will, what they will do for our flooding. Um, and um, uh, just, just to mention that even simple rain tanks are used um, uh, for, for some of these uh, purposes. So we've been working, and this is my current research, on development of very simple conceptual models, because usually 
hydrodynamic models are so complex and rather slow. So we are trying to develop these fast, um, more kind of snapshots of final flood pictures. And I'm just showing some yeah, data um, where, uh, sorry, some results where I'm showing basically our model. I don't know whether the, you, you, yeah, this is maybe a problem. Two flow, which is a commonly used the flood model in our cafe, which is this conceptual model. And they're not too bad. I mean, cafe is pretty close to two flow. Obviously, blue things are where flooding occurred. It's the same catchment. But what's the difference is the speed. Basically, cafe will do it in eight seconds to two minutes by two flow will do it. You know, in hours. And this is the way of giving us a power to model actually implementation of um, some of these systems in um, green, green technologies into our system. Yes, cities. And I don't know. Yeah, this is my final slide. And I don't want to talk too much about the data just to show it's been modeled for actually that catchment, which I showed. Um, 80 years of six minute rainfall. So very fine resolution. Um, when we have uh, no rain tanks, and this is damages, cost damages in that, um, and, and these are the damage costs. And we modeled, obviously, if we have rain tanks, which is the simplest way of also, and if you use that for all sorts of things, whichever way you use them, it's much better than not having them and we can achieve 10 to 15 to 30% reduction in damage costs uh, from this flash flooding if you have these simple rain tanks installed. But this is pretty interesting because at the moment, we are not thinking like that. We are saying you do need, um, um, you know, and, and we are not, not installing them. So all I'm trying to say, maybe we should think as we are developing our cities, um, to, to do more of this, which hopefully can help us minimize flash flooding costs. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, so this uh, this has been a really interesting set of um, of talks, and um, and I see that there's some questions in the chat. If you have any questions for the the speakers, then please. Um, Put them there. We're going to move now to um, to uh, general questions, and I'm going to start the um, the questions with this one. So people live with probability and chance every day, uh, and you know we, we make decisions about what we um, you know whether we cross the road or whether we drive a car or what all sorts of things where there's probability and chance involved. But we often sort of expect more decisive answers from our decision makers, and uh, we often of, um, have trouble understanding probability and chance. So why do you think that is? So um, why do you think we have trouble thinking about uncertainty in general? Um, and I'm going to ask Kate first. I don't know if I want to say we do have a problem understanding uncertainty. I think sometimes we can make better decisions if we're given uncertainties. For example, if you look at a weather forecast, and it tells you there's a 99% chance of 10 millimetres of, of 50 millimetres of rain versus a 1% chance of 50 millimetres of rain, you're more likely to take your brolly out that day. So it's it, it's all about how we communicate that uncertainty, though, I think is what matters and how and and knowing the audience we're trying to speak to when we communicate that uncertainty. I think um if we communicate it well, people can feel empowered by it. And I actually think that was one of the things that we miss sometimes in our scientific communication is if I say a one in 1,000 year event, I'm not, I'm not being honest with you actually because that there's huge uncertainty in that. That could be anything from a one in 100 to a one in 2000 and there could be this huge range and we're not sure about it and I think if I'm honest with you then maybe we can have a better discussion about things but I we can we can debate it more Kerry if you like so I'll, I'll throw it back to you yeah <laughs> okay thank you Amisha do you have any comments on that yeah it's I find um the way we communicate about uncertainty is really an evolving space and it's certainly recognized 
in the science communication literature. In our research, we found community members are very tolerant of uncertainty around weather and um, are tolerant of when things might go awry. But where they're less tolerant is potentially in subsequent events. Um, but there's this really interesting dynamic. Certainty is certainly something we all seek. And um, it's not until an event is perceived as being certain by a community member that they will start to undertake actions. And sometimes those actions are in conflict with what agencies are actually asking them to do, which might be evacuate now. But we've seen in our research that people will actually start to prepare and then evacuate. And that's what we need to try to address prior to events is to and really emphasize what's the optimal course of action for people. Um, but yeah, I think I think sometimes it's also we are well, not everyone is comfortable with numbers and understanding what chance means or percentages mean. And in my opinion, we've got to get rid of this one in 100 year because in the research that Lisa Schuster um, led for us, the one in 100 year event is perceived as being a time driven concept when in reality it's there to communicate the impact, the severity of the impact. And that perception is often lost um, in community members. Yeah, thanks, Amisha. Um, Karen and Anna, do either of you want to make a comment on that? I don't feel that like I could, I don't feel qualified to comment on probabilities as a as an urban planner that focuses on community. <laughs> That's fine. So I'd like to um to ask you then, um, as a as an urban planner, and and um perhaps Anna can comment on this as well. One of the questions in the chat was how easy has it been to have support from policymakers and Congress people and local governments? And do you think that they consider academia when they're making decisions regarding floods, urban planning and infrastructure? Thanks for that comment, by the way, but um, how would you respond to that, Karen? Oh, it's a great comment, a great question. I think they do definitely listen to uh, the evidence that we have. I think one of the challenges is that we're just still trying to get the right evidence to support them in the best way to make some of the decisions that we know they're, they're trying to make now and going forward. So I think there's, a def there's definitely a healthy respect there between government and academia, and we're constantly talking to, uh, to our, our government stakeholders. Um, I think it's a matter of we, we, need, we need to do more to really support them better. Okay, Anna, what about Yeah, I, I do agree, and actually from my personal, um, how can I say, experience, I, I used to work, uh, and I'm still working, for government, like at the moment I'm on this um, panel to, to revive, review strategy for New South Wales, which are, you know, 50 years from now on and working for the minister directly. And there are so many. Yeah, I think they, they actually always reach out. And also, um, um, I, I keep joking, I got that scientist of the year uh, prize that you talked about because I helped the government to get into power that year because I was working <laughs> with that party a position to write their water uh, strategy. Um, it is really important to engage with politicians on both sides, but it comes down to communication and how we get our concepts across and, and we need to listen what they need and we need to help them. And once we help them, they usually uh, particularly like when my experience, when, when they're running um, uh, campaigns for election campaigns, if you get into the ear of some of them, <laughs> your things may happen because they promise these things to, to um, community and then they have to deliver them. And I personally had a few examples in my, in my career of that. Hmm. Okay, thanks, Anna. Um, Karen or, um, or sorry, um, um, Amisha or Kate, do you have a comment on this? Oh, no. I, I found that our industry partners and most of the research that I've done is um, you know, very applied and we've and been funded by industry. And there's a really strong commitment to doing the research and providing and using academics to provide that independent 
evidence base. And, um, you know, often you may come up with, you may not have the best um, solution or an immediate solution with data, as everyone knows. It's not the magic answer. It will present um, some solutions, but also potential problems that require further investigation or, you know, in that lovely sweet spot opportunities. Um, and so often it's this really interesting um, and important collaboration between academics as a data provider, but also industry to take some brave steps about uh, what to do with that work. And, you know, lucky I've been really fortunate to work with uh, industry partners who do that. Okay, thanks. So we have some um, some other comments in the in the chat in the um, questions as well. So um, how much do urban planners consider areas downstream of our dams, and is this a factor when planning? Would anybody like to take that on? I'm not sure I understand the question. I think. Um, well, maybe Nikki can write a little more to that um, to that question, um, and then we can come back to it. Okay, um, we. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to ask a question. Um, uh, there's there's one a bit higher, a bit earlier that was asked, and this was primarily to Kate. So mm -hmm. this question was looking within Australia, but also internationally. Can you highlight examples of good practice in communicating complex issues on risk? and the impact to community, assuming that we're communicating with average non-expert citizens? This is um, a really good question. And I think part of what I want to answer, what I want to say is we're not doing it great yet. Like there's a huge scope for us to do this better. And this is not an Australian unique problem. This is a worldwide problem. Like Germany faced similar issues when they had their floodings. And we can look to other places in terms of how we communicate some out of the science, like other disciplines, even like even looking at COVID, how we discuss we have to flatten this curve or looking at how we communicate things within the IPCC. There's lots of ways we can communicate better with people. But I think from my perspective as someone who's just been through this event in Brisbane and um, and I think Amisha and I had talked about this, is that there was this missing link between this risk or this communication of the weather warnings and there's one thing to say it's going to rain this much there's another thing to translate that into a piece of information that a community member can act upon and that's where you get into this risk and impact base and you can have a high risk event which are really low impact and you can have a low impact event with a really high risk and how we issue a warning for those things needs to be with both, with both of those things in mind. And the Met Office does some of that in London, actually. They mix these impact-based warnings but with the risk. But I don't think it's fair for us to think about BOM being the responsible ones for delivering these impact-based warnings. BOM does the weather and they're great at the weather, right? That's what we want them to be doing. When we start to talk about this impact-based stuff, it has to come down to a local level, like communities and councils and state-based level and how we share our data between all these different places because yes downstream does matter so if you're in Ipswich City Council you need to be talking to Brisbane City Council and you need to be talking to you know further up north or down south in New South Wales and all these different places with all their different data individual sources so um, they have to take these weather warnings and translate them to information about roads and they have to translate that into information about when you should evacuate and timing and other things it's a really, really tricky problem that we can do more to help with, I think, is what I'm trying to get at. Um, maybe I've talked around that a bit more. Maybe some of the other panelists would like to bring clarity into that big bunch of stuff I've just said. So, <laughs> oh, thanks, Kate. That's um, that's uh, that wasn't that was very clear. Thank you. Does anybody else want to comment on that? All right. I'm going to ask a question then. I'm going to say um, that. We've we've heard from from all of you about some of the the the, uh, the positive actions that can be taken by people, um, and communities and governments, um, and so some of these include increased monitoring, community information, increased um, understanding of, of um, probability and uncertainty um, and risk. Um, there's urban planning and moving communities and other 
um, positive actions that can be taken. And of course, some of those positive actions have some negative consequences as well um, that have been um, raised and um, also indicated in the, in the chat. But I'm going to ask each of you, what would be one action that would be most impactful from your perspective going forward in the future um, of, of floods and other disasters? What would be one action that you would say would be most impactful? And I'm going to start with Anna. Okay, so <clears throat> there was actually a question related to that, which said, what would be your response to somebody who said that we should plan to, for places not to flood rather than plan to lock, <laughs> evacuate one? I think that's it. We should actually design our cities thinking about flooding. And that's why I was showing these sort of distributed storages, what they are, and distributed um, at the source um, um, solutions, which are part of your urban fabric. So as you are building your cities, you plan that it's going to happen, and it's going to happen more and more. Um, so I personally believe we should um, install these systems as we, as we build cities and therefore avoid fl uh, flooding as well as don't build in uh, flood prone zones. For example, in Holland, it's got one third of all land below sea level so they could flood easily. Uh, they would be flooded if, if they are not pumping water all the time. They have a big program called a uh, uh, river a uh, room. So even land is so, so, so precious, they're giving room for these big rivers. So you just have to build thinking that rivers will come out. You have to build thinking that you need to manage this runoff as you pay, pay your services. And, um, and somebody asked about engineers having solutions. I can tell you, we, we have solutions and we can build a, even a barrier, um, uh, a, a Brisbane River barrier, like there is Thames barrier. They are super expensive, but we do have solutions which like, in Holland could make sure that even one third of land is below sea level and it doesn't flood, but they are very expensive. Okay, thanks, Anna. What about you, Karen? Oh, it's very hard to take one thing. I think if I had to summarize it, it would be to have a really robust um, dialogue or um, opportunity for good quality stakeholder and community involvement in decision making about these very issues. You know, we have a, a lot of our urban areas are vulnerable because they are located in floodplains and, and these are, you know, we've, we've had these spaces for hundreds of years. Um, so we've got to figure out what our options are to actually support people in these places to be less vulnerable. And, and so some of these really difficult decisions about do we do we relocate people? Do we do we find are there engineering solutions where we can actually give some people more certainty to stay in place? Or do we have to look at more radical options? I think these are conversations that can only be had with community because people are so attached to place and, and we see it time and time again. And there was a comment in the chat about the one of the issues with the Grantham relocation is that it left people behind. Um, and I think, uh, I guess I want to put my comments in context there. If you look globally, where people have tried to plan or taken a really long time to do it, uh, it hasn't happened because uh, people don't see that it's happening and the media turns its attention away and so relocation doesn't happen. I think community dialogue is critical in all cases, uh, particularly because we have to make some of these hard decisions about whether or not we're going to support people in place or how we can retrofit our built environments in order to support them to be less vulnerable. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, so quickly then, Amisha. Um, I guess just knowing we're short on time, to me, trust is really the essential ingredient here. And knowing that we're in a really strong environment of distrust, how we can provide a single point of information or truth to support people's decision making uh, 
is going to be something we need to think about and that's pr prior to events as well as within and following events. Okay, thanks Amisha. And finally, Kate. I think I might piggyback on that a little bit. It was really, it was really difficult to find the information we needed as members of the community during this last event. You're looking at all these disparate places, all these disparate data sources, and actually in order to have a really great response and a really prepared response and a really timely response and really that early action we need to be able to bring some of those different data sources together so we can generate those impact based warnings because we can't stop floods and extreme rainfall that's going to keep happening and having solutions that help us mitigate these losses would be really really great or having better solutions so yeah thanks very much kate that's great so that brings us now to the end of the, 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 um, the webinar, but I want to finish by saying that this series really focuses on data science in the news and floods have certainly been in the news and some of our focus is around data science and its, um, and its application to, um, to floods. But we acknowledge that this is not this issue is not really about data science. It's really about people. So we know that areas have received, um, you know, in March and April, they've received more than a year's worth of rainfall in a week. We know there's been, you know, over 20 people that have died. We know there's more than 20,000 homes and businesses, even in Queensland, that have been flooded. We know there's more than 5,000 homes in New South Wales that have been affected. We know that there's you know, more, more homes even that were impacted in, in the second round in early April. And we know that there's you know, thousands, tens and 30,000 calls for help um, from uh, just in New South Wales alone. This is the most costly disaster in Australia ever. We know that this is about the people who've been involved and we extend our thoughts to all those who've been involved in the floods and hopefully by talking about these kinds of disasters and by having webinars like this, we can help to be better prepared and we can do better in the future. So on that note then, I want to thank all of our panellists. Um, thank you very much, Kate, Anna, Amisha and Karen. And many thanks also to Becky Cook and Tim McCougar from QUT uh, Centre for Data Science for all their help in organising and promoting Data Science in the News webinar series. Our next webinar will be on Friday the 5th of May at 12 to 1 p.m. And we're going to focus then on elections through the prism of data science. And so finally, thank you to our, you, our audience. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. And from the Centre for Data Science, take care and bye for now.